Welcome to The Verdict. I'm Mick Cornett along with Kent Myers, and as you know, we're here every week meeting interesting people and dealing with topical issues, and I'm looking forward to this show. Yeah, we're going to talk today about a, kind of an update on Native American law, and uh, we've got a guy to talk to us about that, a partner of mine named Mike McBride from the Tulsa office. He's head of our uh, Indian law and gaming uh, practice group in uh, Tulsa, well, in the firm, and uh, Mike has got substantial involvement in a number of tribal activities and his perspective is nearly always uh, uh, shaped from the side of the tribe rather mm -hmm. than the, the folks that are dealing with the tribes. And Mike uh, has a great reputation, has a great practice, and is well respected both within the firm and outside the firm and certainly with the tribes. It seems so like about every month there's one more issue coming up that deals with tribal law and how that interacts with the uh, United States government law and so it should be a fascinating show. Yeah, always sovereignty questions about mm -hmm. who can do what when and who has to clear it with whom <laughs> and uh, that's what Mike will be talking to us about a little bit. This show is going to go quickly. Yeah. Mike McBride, today's guest from The Verdict. We'll be right back. I've known I was going to be an artist since I was a little kid. I still have teachers that in grade school that still have my artwork. I think I told them something along the lines, this is keep that, it's going to be worth money someday. I'm Justin Mater, I'm an artist, and I'm Chickasaw. My muse is the Muskokian, the Mississippian art. When I see that, my mind just fills up with bubbles of ideas. My big thing right now is shell carving, the shell origins. My work is refined more and more until I found my own rhythm. I also do metallurgy, where I've uh, been acid etching copper and hammering copper to make a copper repoussé. You only have one chance to do it right, so it, it requires a lot of planning and thought and just patience. My Chickasaw heritage is the foundation of who I am. It's the roots of where I come from, and it inspires me as an artist and inspires the tenacity of never giving up. Learn more about today's Chickasaws at profilesofanation.com. It's a North American energy revolution. We're the fastest growing source of new oil and natural gas supplies in the world. The shift to North American energy will create approximately 3 million jobs. All that money we've been sending overseas, $400 billion a year. Imagine that staying in our economy. It's a game changer. Real energy independence starts now. And it starts with Oklahoma. Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers, and Kent's going to introduce today's guest. Today, we're really pleased to have joining us on the set of The Verdict, Mike McBride, a partner of mine of whom I'm very proud. Uh, he is, did his undergraduate work at Trinity University in San Antonio, did his law work at the University of Oklahoma. He has uh, been chairman of our firm, Crow and Dunleavy's uh, practice group dealing with Indian law and gaming. Uh, he holds both judicial and, uh, and general counsel positions in a number of tribes, including the Kaws, the Pawnees, Seminoles, and others. He'll tell us about that. Uh, he uh, has really spent his uh, active practice for almost 20 years now, or a little bit over 20 years, uh, dealing with tribal matters and uh, Indian-related matters, uh, particularly here in Oklahoma. And he's graciously agreed to come talk to us about that. Mike, sure glad to have you. Thank you, Kent. Proud of you. <laughs> Mike, is, is a significant amount of your work for one tribe or another? Or do you, I know you, you represent several tribes. Is most of it centered around one or two or three tribes? We actively represent over uh, 14 different tribes or their entities, but there are a few that really dominate uh, my time and attention, mm -hmm. like the Comanche Nation and the Seminole Nation, for example. What areas of the law require the most attention? 
what, 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 where's your caseload head? Well, Indian law is one of the most complex uh, and difficult areas because there are so many uh, different overlays of law. It's governed by uh, federal law, uh, the laws that Congress passes. There's a significant amount of uh, law that's shaped uh, by the courts, the U.S. Supreme Court in particular. The United States Constitution mentions Indian tribes three times. So there's a lot of uh, judicial business that makes its way up to the high court and will decide sovereignty issues. Even within the, the last three weeks, we had a major case come down involving tribal sovereignty. Hmm. But you also have state laws and uh, the tribe's laws themselves and the interplay between those. Mm -hmm. Well, now you've occupied judicial posts with a couple of tribes, uh, both as a trial judge, I guess, and a justice on the tribal Supreme Court. That's correct. Uh, tell us about that work. I wear many hats, and I've been a part-time judge and justice for the tribes while at the same time practicing law. It's been a, a wonderful honor to, to be asked and uh, to be confirmed as a Supreme Court justice and a, a district judge. It is like operating as a, you know, a federal judge or a, a state trial judge or a state Supreme Court judge. You're, you're bound by the you know, judicial code of ethics and the laws of the tribe itself, and, and your job is to interpret the tribal constitution and the tribe's laws. You also uh, have served as, or maybe do serve, as Attorney General and General Counsel for the Seminole Nation and the Sac and Fox Nation. That's a different role, of course, than a judicial role. Tell us what you do in that uh, advisory capacity. As Attorney General for the Seminole Nation, which I currently serve and, and our, our firm Crow and Dunleavy serves as a General Counsel and Attorney General, we uh, have duties that are defined under Seminole law and we are a chief law enforcer. We are a prosecutor. We look after juvenile matters and uh, social service issues, uh, deprived children. Uh, we also handle the uh, civil work for the tribe in the tribe's courts. But outside of the, the nation, we also represent uh, the nation and, and state and federal courts as those issues uh, come up. Mm -hmm. uh, we also provide counsel to the 28-member legislature of the, the Seminole Nation uh, and to the, the principal chief and assistant chief of the, the Seminole Nation. Uh, I first became attorney general early in my career at Seminole Nation back in 1997, 1998, and they've, they've asked us back again. During the early 2000s, I was attorney general and general counsel for the Sac and Fox Nation, and uh, the role was slightly different there according to their laws, but, but somewhat similar. How difficult is it balancing what you know about one tribe and their traditions and the, what they expect versus another tribe which may have different expectations? Well, let, let me just uh, tell you the, the broad perspective. There are 565 federally recognized Indian tribes and Alaska Native villages uh, within the United States. And uh, they range in size from the Great Cherokee Nation, which has uh, you know close to 400,000 citizens, down to tiny rancherias in California that that have one or two families and, and mm -hmm. a few members. So there's a great diversity between uh, the customs and traditions and practices of these uh, Alaska Native villagers and uh, uh, Indian nations. So, uh, you know, it can, it can get pretty complicated because a lot of them have their own laws, customs, and uh, you, you have to familiarize yourself with, with those. Um, you don't want to make a mistake and get them confused, mm -hmm. I suspect. Oh, that's true. But at the same time, uh, you know, I'd say that there are a lot of commonalities with, with Native people and uh, Native culture, and I have a deep respect and, and passion for that. Does criminal law transfer over into tribal law, or is criminal law just United States law? 18 United States Code uh, is the, the federal laws that, that govern uh, uh, crimes, and there are a number of uh, federal mm -hmm. statutes that uh, specifically apply to Native Americans and Indian country. And uh, in fact, there's a, a law, uh, 18 United States Code, Section 1151, that says uh, Indian country, and that's the benchmark for where tribal jurisdiction is. Mm -hmm. But tribes themselves also have their own laws. Generally, the federal courts and the U.S. Attorney's Office will handle what are called major crimes, mm -hmm. you know, of, uh, you know, murder, uh, uh, you know, all, all the major crimes like that. Uh, but the, the tribes themselves handle uh, uh, Less, uh, lesser crimes mm -hmm. and prosecute them themselves. They have and, their own and police civil forces. civil crimes? Uh, well, civil is not a, a 
a crime, a cr criminal is, right, is but, but prohibited. But civil cases? Civil cases yeah. as well, that's correct. Are handled by tribal courts? That's right. Okay. Uh, cover just briefly, because we're about to run out of time on this segment, but cover just briefly the uh, uh, information about the citizenship granted to uh, Native Americans in the United States uh, by Congress uh, a number of years ago. Would you believe it that within a single long generation, 1924, Native Americans were first granted U U.S. citizenship for the first time? For all those years, they were not deemed U.S. citizens. 90 years ago, uh, so it, it's a pretty recent phenomenon. Uh, and even in the 1880s, uh, for the first time, uh, courts recognized mm -hmm. Native Americans yeah. as being human beings under the law. Wow. There's a fav famous case called uh, Standing Bear, in which he petitioned uh, habeas corpus, and the federal court said, yes, yeah. he is human, and yes, he, he can seek habeas corpus relief under the yeah. law. So and we've come Prior to that way. time, there had been authority to the contrary, that they're not human beings? That's right. A significant number of people uh, have one ancestor who might have been American Indian or, or two ancestors and, and there, you know, there's a certain sort of, of uh, a fraction that they use to describe their, their American Indian heritage. At what point does, does a person stop being American Indian heritage? Is there a point where the tribes no longer recognize the person as a member of the tribe? Well, that, being a citizen of a tribe is a political classification. It's, it's not a, a blood classification. The tribes themselves define who their citizens are. Now some tribes like the Cherokee Nation, for example, ha uh, have a blood quantum, or, or I'm sorry, a, 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 a role that they use. And if you can trace your ancestry back to someone that, that was on that role, so in, in their case the Dawes roles, then mm -hmm. uh, you're counted as a citizen under their laws. I see. Some tribes actually do have a, a blood quantum. Uh, for example, you know, like one quarter blood, you know, for a particular tribe uh, is the requirement. But again, it, it's, it's a political classification and, and not necessarily a, a blood quantum. I see. Mike McBride's our guest. We're discussing Indian and tribal laws. We'll be right back on The Verdict. When you have something important to communicate, it becomes clear that there's a lot of competition for your audience's attention. So how can your message stand out and actually resonate with your audience? Legal Graphics has the answers. The team at Legal Graphics will work with you to plan, design, and even test your presentation to ensure your message will be heard and remembered. Call Legal Graphics today to schedule an appointment. The readiness is all. The good life comes naturally to Tulsa where nature's beauty is matched with an eye for aesthetics. A legacy of neighborhoods graced with lawns and landscaping and handsome homes. A place that seems to have patented an ideal lifestyle. Bank First is loyal to the quality of life Tulsa assures its citizens, to the priority placed on education, culture, and growth. Loyal to builders who transform raw land into residential charm. Developers who see opportunity and add vitality to Tulsa's economy. Bank First serves both enterprise and private lives that need a loyal partner. It's how we help nurture this city's very good life. Bank First. Loyal to Oklahoma. Loyal to you. back on The Verdict visiting with Mike McBride about tribal issues. He's a, an expert on, on tribal issues and, and the law. Um, you know, typically when I read about uh, issues involving tribal law, a lot of times it goes back to things that happened in the 19th century and maybe even earlier than that. Um, can you talk about the effects of the Civil War and, and, and treaties that took place in the first half of the 19th century and how they um, evolved into today's law? Absolutely. Well, just focusing on Oklahoma in particular, uh, Oklahoma used to be Indian territory, and we had over 200 Indian nations that were uh, forcibly removed and uh, became uh, residents within Indian territory, which later became Oklahoma. Uh, during the Civil War, uh, some of the tribes uh, actually supported the Confederacy, 
and pledged their support there. Others supported the Union. And uh, after uh, the Civil War ended, uh, there were a number of treaties uh, that were signed. And, and some of them, uh, like with the, the Cherokee Nation and the Seminole Nation in particular, uh, required that the uh, Indian nations take in uh, freedmen, uh, freed slaves, and become citizens of, of the, uh, the nation themselves by treaty. Now, uh, throughout time, there have been cases that, from the U.S. Supreme Court that says that uh, Indian tribes uh, have the exclusive authority and power to determine very personal family things and, and things such as citizenship. And uh, so in recent years, uh, there, there's been a controversy in, in which tribes want to redefine who their membership is. As we discussed earlier, that's a political question. Mm -hmm. And for example, the uh, Cherokee Nation amended their constitution uh, within the past decade. And it required that to be a Cherokee citizen, you have to be Cherokee by, by blood and that you have to trace back to the Dawes Rolls. And as a result, uh, the Cherokee Nation sought to um, exclude the, the freedmen that were previously recognized as citizens under their treaty. Now, today there's a lawsuit pending in the United States courts, and it's been consolidated in Washington, D.C., in the District of Columbia. And uh, there were oral arguments on May 5th, uh, and I attended those oral arguments, and, and they dealt with the freedmen arguing that they should be allowed to continue to be Cherokee citizens. And the Cherokee Nation itself uh, arguing, no, we should have a right to be able to define who our citizens are. And uh, if we choose to define you know, a role or a blood quantum, then you know, that's our prerogative and that's our right. And it dates back to some of these uh, mm -hmm. treaty issues. That How'd that turn out? Has it been resolved? Uh, the judge says he's going to rule on a motion for summary judgment, and it, it should happen soon. I expected a decision uh, last month, but it hasn't happened yet. Talk about what most of our uh, non-Native American citizens would know about tribes, and that would be gaming. We've seen the proliferation of uh, casinos, Indian casinos, sprouting up in Oklahoma. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Well, gaming has been a, a tremendous successful economic policy for Indian tribes. It's been the most successful economic development policy in the history of the United States. and. Uh, we, we actually had high stakes bingo in Oklahoma in the late 70s and early 80s. The Seneca Cayuga tribe, for example, in Northeast Oklahoma, the Muscogee Creek Nation in, in Tulsa engaged in high stakes uh, gaming. And those are traditional uh, activities that Indians have uh, engaged in uh, for over the millennia through their traditional games, hang games and, and so forth. So uh, there were uh, battles between the state government wanting to assert criminal and civil jurisdiction over tribes on their Indian country over such gaming activities. For example, Oklahoma uh, said you can't engage in a high stakes bingo like that. So uh, Ottawa County uh, prosecutor tried to enforce against the, the tribes and, uh, and did so. And a case went up to the Oklahoma Supreme Court in 1985 called uh, State X Rel May versus Seneca Cayuga tribe that said yes, the state has jurisdiction over that. The, Tribes pushed back in a case called Seneca Cayuga versus uh, Thompson that went all the way to the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals. And it reversed the Oklahoma Supreme Court mm -hmm. uh, under federal law saying, no, Oklahoma, you don't have jurisdiction on Indian country. At the same time in, in Florida, uh, with the Florida Seminoles, uh, they had high stakes bingo as well. And uh, uh, cases went up there, Seminole Tribe versus uh, Attorney General Butterworth uh, that also came, came down in favor of the tribes. But the big case was 1987, and that was with uh, the Cabazon Band of Mission Indians in California against the state of California. And they, they had high stakes gaming going on out there on the reservation, and the state sought to uh, prohibit that. So the case got decided by the U.S. Supreme Court, and uh, the U.S. Supreme Court said, so long as it isn't criminally prohibited within the state and only civilly regulated, the tribes can engage in it exclusively without state control. Mm -hmm. So that really opened up the, the floodgates, and it also motivated Congress to act the very next year in 1988 under the uh, Reagan administration with the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act of 1988. 
And that set a comprehensive regulatory structure for indie gaming and divided it basically into three classes. The traditional gaming that is exclusive to Indian tribes, the class two gaming like bingo, pull tabs, and games similar to bingo that tribes regulate uh, themselves along with the federal government, but states don't have any role to play on that. And then a residual category called class three. And class three involves slot machines, back rack, uh, the, the full penelope of games that you might see in Las Vegas. But the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act uh, really set some stability. Mm -hmm. Financing started to come into Indian country. Uh, you could see a lot more development. Banks were comfortable in lending. Mm -hmm. uh, there, but there's also a role to play for states. Tribes had to give up some sovereignty. To engage in that class three residual category, tribes and states had to enter into a compact. And a compact is a, is a, is a government to government agreement. And uh, IGRA said, the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act says that Indians are not taxed. Uh, you can't tax gaming revenue. The U.S. Constitution also says that, hmm. that you can't tax Indians. But uh, we've seen over time that to negotiate these agreements, states uh, start to insist to have fees paid to the, to the mm -hmm. state. And uh, in Oklahoma, we, we've seen these uh, fees creep in as well. Mm -hmm. But the Department of Interior, uh, the federal government, will only approve these compacts so long as it, it's an exclusivity fee and that the tribe is getting some sort of benefit out of it. Last 20 years or so, we've seen uh, different issues come up about uh, sports teams having Native American um, images. Um, Stanford University changed its name uh, here in Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City University changed its name. Uh, now the Washington Redskins are running into trademark issues, which seemed a, a little bit different from all the uh, the other name changes that we've had in the past. What's your take on the Redskins trademark issue? I'm biased, and I've got an opinion on this. <laughs> well, good, let's hear it. Well, Native people, by and large, are very offended by the term Redskins, and it, it dates back to a, a horrible era in which uh, bounties were placed upon uh, the skins of Native Americans, that if you brought in a, a red skin, then you were paid money uh, for killing that person. And what, what a horrible pejorative uh, history, uh, and to use that, that term and that moniker. I know a lot of my Anglo friends will say, well, what's the big deal? Move on. Uh, you know, it's actually respectful of honoring uh, Native Americans, but Indian people don't see it that way, by mm -hmm. and large. So you would, so you would say, Chiefs is are Chiefs. The name Chiefs is okay, but Redskins is not. Is that my words, not yours? But I'm, it, it, is there a difference? Well, I, I think there is a difference, mm -hmm. and uh, Redskins is is extremely pejorative, and, and people are deeply offended and, and hurt by that. And you know, it's it's it is a racial classification. Mm -hmm. I, we I don't yeah. think that people would stand for the. The Cincinnati Jews or the uh, you know uh, Baltimore Negroes, uh, no one would would stand for that. But here we have uh, these these terms that continue to you know stand out in, in history mm -hmm. uh, you know, that that hurt Native American people. And the, the issue is not going away. It, it seems like it's it's alive and well. They the Redskin franchise has lost their trademark protection for now, but they vowed to appeal. And uh, until uh, a, a court finally decides, they still do have protection, but the tables are turning. That's mm -hmm. in the federal system, so it'll end up ultimately in the Supreme Court. It could. Good. Yeah. Just about 30 seconds left. What do you want our audience to know about? Uh, what, what's, what are misconceptions out there that you could clear up in, in, in a short period of time? Well, going back to gaming, uh, it is not profit. It is revenue that's used for government operations. Gaming in particular, uh, Indian gaming is the most highly regulated gaming in the world. Tribes have their own gaming commissions. There's the National Indian Gaming Commission, and then there's oversight uh, by the states uh, for gaming. Yeah. In Oklahoma, uh, you know, I mentioned those uh, exclusivity fees. Oklahoma has uh, enjoyed $862 million hmm. since the 2004 uh, compacts have come into place. We're going to have to make that the, the final comment of the show. That's a significant amount of money. Thanks for coming. We'll have to get you back when we have more time. We'll be back with more. Kent and I will have a final word after this. The human body, an amazing machine. What we're capable of is astonishing.
If we look to what makes us human, we find that life is more than a heartbeat, and hope is more than an idea. That knowledge moves us forward, and our community keeps us together. OU Medicine is at its heart, keeping Oklahoma alive and well. All children deserve a life of hope and love, but sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. When that happens, each child deserves all the quality, assistance, and representation that can be offered in our legal system. For more information, call 23CHILD. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. You will always be mom and dad to me. We lived on a family farm. We didn't have other families that lived close to us. Right. And uh, we wanted our kids to grow up being friends. You know? And so when they, when they did grow up and disperse, it wasn't hard mm -hmm. to acclimate to other parts of society mm -hmm. or being a friend. You will always be mom and dad to me. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of The Verdict. The Journal Record. Since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. And for almost 30 years, Oklahoma political government and business leaders have turned to the McCarville Report for accurate, reliable, inside information. Visit the McCarville Report online. back on the verdict. Michael McBride was our guest. He's an expert on tribal law. Indeed. Well respected around the state and the nation for his activities in uh, that area. In all aspects. It's a, it's a very complex legal area. One of the most difficult uh, areas that uh, very few people have the courage to uh, jump mm -hmm. into, but Mike's really done it well. Has to be, you, know, you have state jurisdiction at some point. It, it, it breaks down into to tribal jurisdictions and, and counties and it's a it's a very complicated situation. Indeed. You, fair, you never quite get your thumb on it. Uh, we have a couple of websites to give you uh, more information on these subjects. Uh, first of all, you can go to Mike and Kent's law firm. Their website is <laughs> CrowDunleavy.com. That's CrowDunleavy.com. And we have a website, TheVerdict.tv. Tell us about a guest you'd like to see on a future edition of The Verdict. We'll see you next week.